But tonight, I want to talk to you about now, this life. And I want to talk to you about the good life. Now, that may sound like a self-help or prosperity type topic, but it's not. I don't want to talk to you about the world's version of the good life. And it's often pictured by warm sandy beaches, full bank accounts, notoriety, luxury homes, luxury cars. I don't want to talk to you about those things. I want to talk to you about the biblical understanding of the good life. And in doing this, my goal is to give you a hope of a brighter tomorrow. And by tomorrow, I mean tomorrow and next week and the week after. In this life. And I want you to have that hope of the good life regardless of your earthly circumstances. Because even if the outer man is wasting away, the inner man can be being renewed day by day. So that's what I want to talk to you about. And so as we read that text uh, tonight, you may have noticed a specific phrase. And this is the phrase from which the topic of this sermon is drawn. In verse 10, it says, Whoever desires to love life and see good days. In this passage, Peter is talking to those people who desire the good life. Now, I assume that is all of you. Only the jaded have abandoned that desire. And it is possible for people to forget that this is possible. Even Christians can forget that a good life is possible. And there are people out there today considering suicide because they have forgotten that, the, that life can be a blessing regardless of how bad circumstances, uh, circumstances can become. Teens especially. That is just on the rise. So tonight, if your desire is to love life and see good days, then Peter is going to be talking directly to you in this text. So it'd be wise for us to pay attention. I know that's my desire. And so... We need to understand this. Now, to really make this stick, to really make us begin to understand what's going on here, we need to remember that Peter was speaking to people facing fierce persecution. This was part of the diaspora where they, they had to uh, abandon where their homes and everything because the persecution was so bad. Some people were being put to death. All sorts of terrible things were happen happening. And Peter is saying, in the midst of that, you can love life and see good days. So if you want to know what the outline of the evening is, we're just going to take this verse by verse. So I pray you keep your Bibles open, and we're just going to take uh, each verse at a time and go through this. So where we are, we're coming into a passage, in the middle of a passage. Peter has been teaching about how we are to live the Christian life in regards to relationships. He's talking about our, our need to submit to authority, master, servant, all this type of stuff. Where he's talked to us about how husbands are relate to their wives and wives are relate to their husbands. And now he's coming and he's going to summarize some things and say, finally, in verse 8, that's what that means. Finally, in light of all of this, here's some things you need to know. Here's some things you need to pursue. Now, the key to the good life is so much more about being the type of person we need to be than our circumstances. And so as we move into this, I'm going to take this first part pretty quickly because it's the later part that I want to spend more time in. But he gives us some characteristics we should be pursuing. He says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. These should be things we are pursuing as believers. Unity of mind. No matter what differences we have in this church or in the church in general, 
whether it be in nature, like abilities or looks or anything, or in civic relationships. I'm the boss. I'm the employee. I'm, you know, I have this role. I have, you have that role. Regardless of all of that, the church should be one. Differences in race, differences in gender, as far as, um, you know, in whether someone's worthy to be a Christian or anything like that, whether a servant or master, none of those things should cause division in the church. We are all to be unified under the word of God. We all say, this is our authority and this is what we follow. So unity of mind, sympathy. We are called to rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We are to feel for our brother and sister in Christ. Now, pride is actually what makes this more difficult to do than it sounds. Because when someone rejoices, we often become jealous. Why did they get that? Why didn't I get that? And so we don't rejoice when people rejoice. And then when people weep, we think, well, I probably would have never got myself into that situation. And so pride causes this to happen. So the foundation of the sympathy, as we'll see is humility. We'll look at humility in just a minute. But we are to be people who care for each other, love each other. And this cannot happen without a foundation in unity. So we have unity of mind. We're supposed to feel a certain way according to our brothers. We're supposed to also act a certain way. We're supposed to have brotherly love. We have the same father. We're supposed to lift each other's burdens, forgive each other, build each other up. When someone's in need, we come and we support if we are able. So we're supposed to be doing those types of things. And we're supposed to have a tender heart. Sensitive. It kind of goes very closely to sympathy here. But we're supposed to feel for each other, not be callous. We're supposed to listen to each other and minister to each other. And then finally, we're supposed to have a humble mind. This is the foundation of all of it. You can't have any of the things above that I just mentioned if we do not have humility. We're not to be overbearing. We're not to be condescending. We're not supposed to think we deserve something good that others do not. Do not think more highly of ourselves than we ought, Scripture says. And if we're looking to the good life, humility is the foundation. It is what leads to contentment. It is what ends so many stri strivings and quarrelings with our fellow believer and even non-believers. It is the foundation. Humility flows from the Beatitudes. It flows from being poor in spirit and mourning over sin and being meek and hungering for righteousness. Those are all characteristics that require humility. So we're supposed to be this type of people. We're supposed to desire these types of things, uh, characteristics in our lives. Why are we to do that? Well, verse 9 tells us uh, what the point is. And he gives us, a, he says, first, do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, bless. That's the goal. For to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. So all of the above characteristics are given to us to help us fulfill our calling in our relationships with other people, and that is to bless others. One of the reasons many people are not living the good life according to Scripture is because they're trying to bless themselves, not others. They're trying to grab all they can and then sometimes that involves holding people back. I don't want you to succeed because that means I don't get to succeed. Well, that's already heading down the path of the poor life, <laughs> the, the bad life, whatever the opposite of the good life is. And so he gives us some instructions here. We're called to bless. Those characteristics help us do that. But if you were like the, the people in um, Peter's day that he was writing to, facing fear, fierce persecution, what's your natural response when people come against you and seriously come against you? Take your home. Push you away. How do we respond? I mean, think about today. 
You can go on social media and read all sorts of people or even just pay attention to the news saying wicked things about the church and about Christians because our views on gender or views on sexuality or things like that. They are reviling, reviling, trying to put laws in place that'll get you kicked out of your place of employment. How do you respond when you see that? Here's how we're called to respond. Verse 9, 1 Peter chapter 3. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling. If this simple verse were followed, imagine how different Christian engagement on social media would be in many situations. Much of the culture hates biblical truth. And when they revile, we like to revile back. But we are not to do the same thing. If you answer a fool like a fool, you've become a fool. We are to do something different. Now, we have trouble living in this world doing that. We've all fallen short in this from time to time. We even have trouble doing it within the church amongst each other. Someone will say something, we say something back. Someone gossips something about us, we gossip to other people. These are not the way we are called to live. On the contrary, the, verse 9 continues, bless, for to this you have been called. Instead, we are desire to desire good for those who hate us, good for those who do wrong things to us. We don't want to beat them down. We want the non-believer to come to the knowledge of Christ and the believer who may be doing some of those things to grow in spiritual maturity. Now, this does not mean we may not have to say some very hard things in the process. But what is our motive? It should all be done for the hopes of their salvation. I saw a video on YouTube uh, this week that actually was a perfect picture of this. It was a, a gentleman, a Christian out there preaching scripture and standing against abortion. And a young woman, probably in her 20, 25 years old, came up to him and just starts reviling. You hate women. You, you're just terrible. You're just all this kind of stuff. And she's just like going at him. And at some point, you know, he says, no, abortion is evil. You shouldn't do that. And she had already explained, I had an abortion. It was my choice. I did the right thing. It was wonderful. All this kind of stuff. And he says, uh, she says to him, did you expect me to become a, mo a mother at age 16? And he said, no, ma'am. You became a mother at age 16. And you killed the child. And you see her demeanor change. It hit. She knew. And she just begins to, there's just a little bit of a tremble. And her friend comes, the, the conversation's over, but the friend comes and begins walking away. And that man says, but you can be forgiven in Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus can wash away your sin. Don't forget that as you're walking away. Please don't forget you. That's why I'm here. Yes, I want you to know the truth about abortion, but I want you to know Jesus Christ. And she walks away, and hopefully that Holy Spirit will drive that message in. But being people who are called to bless does not mean we may not need to say hard things. That will hurt people, offend people. But what is our motive in saying it? It is not to beat them down. It's to draw them to Christ. We should be praying for people who are reviling us. If we're not praying for them, I would say don't bother engaging them. Responding to people who revile us without being willing to pray for them often exposes our poor motives. We're doing it for some other reason. But he continues. So we do this. Verse 9 do this, bless others, 
that you may obtain a blessing. If this is how we live, blessing others, there is also a blessing for us. And this blessing, as we'll go through this passage, is, I believe, the definition of the good life. So what Peter is going to do here now is he's going to say, you don't trust me, I'm going to quote the Old Testament. So he's going to quote Psalm 34, 12, starting in verse 12 in a few verses. And so he says this, For whoever desires to love life and see good days. So again, this blessing that he's already mentioned leads to the good life. It leads to loving life and seeing good days. And unfortunately, many of us have lost this. We've lost the fact that there is a good life that Christ is holding out to us. And instead of pursuing that, we've started pursuing the things of the world to give us the good life, which they can't do. And so Peter's saying, revert your eyes back to where they need to be. But even the psalmist is going to start with something we've already done. The psalmist is David. He's fleeing for his life from Saul. So even David is in a terrible situation, and he's going to talk to us about the good life. He's going to start by saying, but first and foremost, character matters. So it says, verse 10, this is still quoting the psalm, for whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. People who will have the characteristics we've already covered Uh, this evening and are desiring to bless others their tongues cannot speak evil those are contradictory things this includes all kinds of communication writing uh, video production anything in our communication with others we cannot be deceitful I believe this includes everything from using foul language to sharing memes on social media that only communicate half-truths. Now, controlling the tongue is hard. James tells us that the tongue is set on fire by hell. It is what leads to so many problems in our lives, the misuse of it. But it can only be controlled by the Holy Spirit. We must be under His Uh, leading in order to even be able to do this but so we should not be people who speak deceit or evil but put positively what are we supposed to speak we're to be people of the truth not only in sincerity meaning what we say not flattery or deception or things like that but our words should also correspond or align with the word of God That is how we are to speak. Not just not saying bad things, but saying and speaking the truth in love. And so, uh, we, this is how we're called. So first, watch how you speak. Second, turn from evil. Uh, Verse 11 says this, let him turn away from evil and do good and let him seek peace and pursue it. If the last verse was telling us to watch what we say, this verse is now telling us to watch how we act. We're to turn away from evil regardless of how it's presented to us. We do not walk in the way of the wicked. We are not to sit in the seat of scoffers or stand with sinners. Sometimes we even need to abstain from the appearance of it. We should not laugh at the jokes that wickedness tells. We should not watch TV shows, no matter how well produced or how good the story is, if it is glorifying evil. Turn away from evil. Even if it causes us to lose our jobs, to lose our friends, or our reputations, turn away away from evil. Why? Because you and I have a calling and it is to bless others and we cannot fulfill that calling by running in the ways of wickedness. 
or speaking deceit and lies and foul language and all sorts of things. Don't lose your calling. This is why we lose focus. We forget what we're called to be. Instead, it says, we are to seek peace. Peace first and foremost with God and then peace with others as much as is possible with us. And we should pursue it. Conflict is not our desire, but we should not only try to avoid quarrels and strife, we should try to pursue the opposite. All of this is part of how we are to be a blessing, and it leads to the blessing. So this is now where we're getting into what I really think is talking about the good life tonight. It leads to loving life and seeing good days. What is the blessing that follows? Verse 12 tells us very clearly. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Let me just mention very quickly about the face of the Lord is against those who do evil, because that's not where I'm going to spend unpacking the rest of this. You can have luxury cars, luxury homes, warm sandy beaches, everything this world says is the good life, wealth, all of it, and the face of the Lord can still be against you. And that is not the good life, no matter how much you enjoy it. We're looking for something greater. So why do all of this above? What, what is the, the blessing? He says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. This means more than the fact that God sees what you and I do. He sees what everybody does. No one does anything outside of the knowledge and wisdom of God. This is saying something different. This is saying he is watching over you. You are precious to him. He's not going to let anything happen to you that is outside of his sovereign will. He is caring for you despite what you may be facing. The eyes of the Lord are upon you. Second Chronicles 16.9 says this, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to give strong support to those whose heart is blameless towards him. Some translations say to those who trust in him. To say that the eyes of the Lord are on you is to say that he becomes your strength when you can't handle it. He says it is, he's becoming your support. He is your rock of protection. And if God is for you, who can be against you? There is no place we can go. Even if we make our bed in hell, and that is a poetic language speaking about the worst possible situations in this life, that he, we, we can't even go to those places that he is not there and he is not caring for us and he is not guiding us. So not only are his eyes on you, his ears are open to your prayers. The verse continues, and his ears are open to their prayers. On top of watching over us, he is not only hearing, he is responding. He is responsive to your prayers. That's what it means when it says he hears. He hears every prayer. He hears everything. But for the righteous, he responds to them. People who trust in the Lord naturally call out to him. It's this penchant for praying that comes from our trust in him. If we trust in him, that's why we pray. If there is little prayer in our lives, it may be because there's little dependence upon him. We can say all the right words that we depend on him, but we're never asking him for anything, asking him to guide us. Are we really trusting in him? But his eyes, they're roaming to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to be strong on behalf of those who put their trust in him, those who call out to him in prayer. 
When we trust, we pray. And when we pray, his ears are open and he is responsive. This is why scripture says the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. It doesn't say the prayers of the righteous man are heard. It actually accomplishes something because God moves. Now, this does not mean he will give us everything we ask. You may be asking for healing from an illness or a problem at work, and his answer will be no. But that does not mean he is not going to react and show his strength on your behalf, maybe even through the sickness or maybe even through the conflict at work. He will show himself strong on your behalf. Sometimes that means he's going to wipe away the illness. Sometimes that means he'll fix the problem at work. But it always means, regardless of how he answers, he's going to respond and uphold you. So how do we do this? How do we enter this good life? Well, if you're like me, going through all of this, you probably went, well, the prayers of a righteous man avail as much. The eyes are on the righteous. <sighs> Am I righteous? I fall short in so much of this. I often revile when I shouldn't revile. My lips speak deceit, and I don't always avoid evil. I don't turn away from it. Sometimes I go right to it. If the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and we are not righteous, where is our hope? Our righteousness must be found in another. Must be found in someone else. To be considered righteous, we must trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning work on the cross. It is only through faith that our sins can be forgiven and his righteousness be counted as ours. Now notice this. The new birth changes us. And those who come to him are people that the Holy Spirit is working in. And the first thing it produces is poverty of spirit. Knowing that I have nothing, Lord, that merits your salvation, that merits your approval of me. There's nothing in me I can offer you. Poverty of spirit. They are also meek, which means they submit to God's authority. I'm going to stop trying to do it my way, stop, stop trying to earn my way to salvation and build my, make my own rules of how life should be lived and what the good life is. I'm going to do what you say, Lord. So I have nothing to offer you. Now I'm submitting to your authority and I'm mourning over my sinfulness. I know it's an affront to you, Lord. And now I'm just hungering for righteousness and those who hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be filled first and foremost Christ's righteous perfect righteousness is accounted to you and you are now approved in Christ Jesus justification but on top of that the Lord is beginning a work in you to make you more and more righteous even in yourself in this life all of those things, again, I mentioned, poor in spirit, meek, mourning over sin, hungering for righteousness, those are all acts of humility. They lead to things like tender hearts, brotherly love, sympathy, unity of mind, all, all of it, all the stuff we've been talking about. This is the only foundation for anything we've talked about tonight. If you don't have salvation in Jesus Christ and you've not gone to him seeking a righteousness apart from your own for salvation, then you have nothing that we've already mentioned. You don't have unity of mind. You don't have sympathy. You don't have brotherly love. We just don't have it. But if we do have it and we have come to Lord's salvation, we have already entered the good life. Now, our closeness to the Lord waxes and wanes, which we're going to next. But you have already entered it. Think about the day you came when you finally realized, I'm a child of God. We have a brother at uh, 
at Bethel Grace Baptist Church where we, we serve, and his name is Larry. And this man, you know, it's just a joy to be around. And in the 60s, he was into the drugs and everything, and the Lord snatched him out, about, out of that. And he said, Doug, the day I came to Jesus Christ, even the sky was more blue than I'd ever seen it. Something had changed. He had entered the good life. So again, the good life is not about sandy beaches, wealth, luxury. There's not a problem with those things. Whether you have them or not isn't the issue. They're just not where you find the good life. Because you can have, again, all of those things and lose your soul. The face of the Lord can be against you. That's not the good life. On the contrary, the good life is finding salvation in Jesus Christ, walking according to his word, seeking the blessing of others, and having his eyes upon us, caring for him caring for us and trusting him so much that we call out to him in prayer and he hears those prayers and becomes strong on our behalf the good life will still be hard though the good life will be painful the good life will still be difficult again Peter's audience was facing persecution and he was not promising that it would go away but he was telling them that the Lord would be with them no matter what they faced. He would give them the strength they needed and he would hear them when they prayed. And even if the outer man was wasting away, the inner man can be renewed day by day. The Lord, if you are a child of God, is your shepherd. You shall not want he will make you lie down in green pastures. That's spiritual language he's talking about here. Those are metaphors for spiritual realities. Where will he make you lie down in green pastures and never want? Even while you walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's why you don't have to fear. He will prepare a table for you. Where? Even in the presence of your enemies. Your cup will overflow. And goodness and mercy will follow you all of the days of your life. Corey Ten Boom experienced this in a concentration camp. But so often we're looking at the things of the world saying, please me, give me the good life. And God's saying, I'm right here. I've got it. Do you have any hope of the good life going in tomorrow, into tomorrow? Monday morning. You may be dying of an illness. You may have to face something terrible in court, a broken relationship. But even with all that, you should have hope of a good life going into tomorrow if you're a child of God. Because you can continue to grow closer and closer with your Lord. But we rarely seek Him in this way because Satan has blinded us to the fact that tomorrow can actually be better than today spiritually. And because he's blinded us to the fact, again, we lose focus and we focus on the things of the world. And so tonight I'm saying, let this truth, that the good life, the blessing of the Lord upon those who seek him can be yours. It, it, it's ours as children of God. Move into it more and more and more. Let it send you to the scriptures instead of so much time with TV or social media. Let it send you to your knees in prayer. If you're a child of God at this very moment, his eyes are on you. And when you pray, he will hear you. Now you may be sitting here hearing all of this 
being reminded that, oh yes, this is what it's about. You're being awakened to that truth. And you're sitting there thinking, his eyes are on me. They're, often the re- response to that is, oh Lord, I have so many things I need to talk to you about. You want God, God's response to that is, I've been waiting to hear from you. You stopped coming to me. You got blinded by the things of the world. But don't worry. You became my child long ago and my eyes were never off of you. That is why in my sovereignty I brought you out to church in a small little congregation on Sunday night to remind you of this. I wanted you to hear this message from my word. It was my spirit that brought you here and it is my spirit that is driving it deep into your heart because I'm calling you home. I'm calling you to the good life. Don't get distracted by the world. That's why your heart is responding. My eyes are upon you and they've always been upon you. And I am being strong on your behalf. That's why you're here. And when you call to me tonight, when you go home and you start talking to me about all the things you need to talk to me about, I will hear and I will be strong there as well. I never lose a child. My friends, regardless of how hard life may be, this is a life we can love, and these are days we can call good. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for your love for us. None of this is deserved. It is just pure grace and pure mercy. Lord, not only have we not been following after what you've told us to do, we've said we don't even need your blessing, Lord. There's other things that make us happy. We praise you for your word and reminding us that there is something more we are called to be and there is a blessing that follows being those type of people. So we just pray in the power of your Holy Spirit that you help us live this out. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.